what does this airliner, this two-seat trainer, this supersonic jet fighter, and this World War II bomber all have in common? Let's find out on Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. What these four airplanes have in common is they're all involved in amazing stories and coincidences. But before we dive in and find out what those stories are, a quick reminder that we're starting a new program uh, on the channel, exclusive paid content. And I'd like to reintroduce my daughter, Melissa, who is the administrator of this new program. She's the inspiration behind this channel. And uh, there's a link in the title block for you to sign up. There is no obligation, but you'll see Melissa's name in the link. You can even vote for your favorite aviation topics. We look forward to the new program and we'll keep you informed. And now back to our program. There's plenty of sayings in aviation like this one. The two most useless things in an airplane are altitude above you and runway behind you. Or how about if God had intended man to fly, he would have given him more money. And then there's certain aviation phenomena simply cannot be explained. And so let's go back to uh, some early inspirations for my career. The story begins in New York City, Christmas 1956. We had gone into the city to visit my grandparents, and they had the new issue of Life magazine on the coffee table. You see it there. That's a special holiday issue that year. And I remember sitting on the couch and opening it up and seeing a two-page ad that just took my breath away. I was nine years old. You saw my constellation drawing it didn't look anything like this i was mesmerized and i stared at this image for what seemed like hours i just couldn't believe it i later found out the name of the artist was ren wicks wicks had gained fame during world war ii and in the post-war years as a uh, iconic uh, titan of commercial illustration he created these dramatic landscapes he would ha he was howard hughes's personal artist so he did all the ads for TWA, the uh, Connies, and the first 707s when they came into service. And he even uh, designed stamps for the U.S. Post Office. He always went by the term the irascible Wren Wicks. A darling man, a uh, immense talent. I was very privileged to have him as a friend. We were assigned a number of Air Force art program uh, projects together. Uh, this one was the coverage of the first uh, orbital shuttle landing of the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia in April 1981, and we both flew in this uh, Huey to cover the landing. This was my uh, donation that year to the Air Force Art Program. Ren did a similar painting. And 11 years later, they, we were involved in another shuttle landing, but I didn't realize it at the time. We watched the first landing of the Endeavor at Edwards Air Force Base. I went out with the aeromedical crew in the caravan out to the runway. Uh, that's me on the right and my friend, uh, Chris Ledette, who was the flight surgeon at Edwards at that time. And uh, it was amazing to be that close to the shuttle uh, when it landed. And I noticed there was a, a group of people and there was a, a gentleman in a white uh, coveralls with a little uh, floppy pork pie hat. Guess what? It was Ren Wicks. He was on assignment for the NASA documentary art program. I thought it was pretty cool to stand next to uh, a spacecraft that had been in orbit an hour earlier. Uh, and at the time that this photo was taken by my dear friend, Tony Landis, little did I know that sitting in the cockpit of the shuttle was none other than Ren Wicks. I believe that's called one-upsmanship, but good for him. Well, there's more to the story. Something else happened in 1992, my first limited edition airliner print that became an instant sellout. It showed an actual flight of a TWA Super G Constellation from Kansas City to New York, carrying 63 passengers and beginning its final approach to runway 13 left at Idlewild Airport. It was Christmas Eve, Monday, December 24th, 1956, and the painting was titled Home for the Holidays. It was entered into an exhibit at the uh, American Society of Aviation Artists Annual Forum in San Diego that year, and it won the Founders Award. I was very honored. But uh, sitting in the audience, I noticed a figure carrying my painting up to the stage for the award ceremony, 
and it was none other than Ren Wicks. Now, think of the irony. I painted a painting of an airplane at Christmas 1956, which is when I was looking at the Life magazine ad painted by Ren that literally helped inspire my career. Our next story is Treasures from the Past. That's me on the right and my dear friend Rick Johnson, partner in crime out there at Lake Elsinore, California. Rick and I gave glider rides, and we became very close friends. Rick had been born and raised in southern Illinois, and we uh, often talked about our mutual love of aviation and our favorite airplanes. Mine was the uh, Piper Cherokee 180 that I took lessons in, and for Rick, it was a swept tail Omnivision Cessna 150. Well, a few years ago, uh, here's a picture of Rick and I flying on tow, but a few years ago, Rick uh, got back in touch with his beloved instructor, Cindy, and uh, that was a big moment. He was just so thrilled to be able to thank her for all the wonderful uh, instruction and inspiration for his aviation uh, career. And uh, lo and behold, he acquired a photo of the original 150 that he flew in, November 8202 Fox. There was just one problem. The photo had shifted in color. The airplane was actually that beautiful blue that Cessna had in the mid-1960s. So uh, I took the photo, put it into Photoshop and Illustrator, and uh, got it uh, cleaned up and balanced and uh, uh, got the composition all arranged. But uh, the last step was to make the color that Rick's airplane was when he flew it in the late 1960s. Our next story is tribute to a father. And this involves my friend Casey Law. Casey's dad uh, flew as a navigator in B-29s in World War II and then later got a job working for North American. And so Casey had a deep affinity for that company and became a client of mine, uh, buying a number of uh, North American uh, aircraft in paintings that I had produced. Uh, we also became friends with uh, Air Force Colonel Clyde East, World War II ace, and flew uh, RF-101s during the Cuban Missile Crisis and Navy Captain Bob Elder. And it was really a joy for Casey and I to take these uh, fine gentlemen to lunch and listen to the stories. Uh, it was just an amazing friendship, an amazing association. Well, a few years back, I received uh, a cache of original Kodachrome slides in color from World War II. And there were transports, bombers, fighters, and a series of photos on the B-29. So I emailed them up to Casey. Uh, a little bit of a bittersweet story here. Casey was battling cancer at the time, and I sent these photos to try and lift his spirits. Well, I emailed him up in the morning, and about three hours later, I got this very excited phone call from Casey. And uh, I had sent him photos not just of a B-29, but an airplane from his father's unit the 468th Bomb Group, flying in the China-Burma Theater. Now take a look at the nose art, and you notice the uh, camels, which were indicative of the missions that were flown. But that is Casey's dad's airplane. It was named Lassie, and that's Casey's father. The 468th arrived in India in April of 1944. Their initial mission was to fly fuel, ammunition, and spare parts 1,200 miles to an advanced base in China. Six round trips were necessary to deliver enough fuel for one combat mission. And that's why there are camels on the nose of the airplane. And finally, people from the past. And this is really amazing because these are folks that uh, came back into my life because of my YouTube channel. I never would have expected it. I'd mentioned flying gliders at Lake Elsinore. Uh, I was there from 1971 until the uh, airport was closed uh, due to a flood in 1980. But uh, it was just some wonderful flying and some wonderful people. And uh, I was contacted by uh, folks that I had given rides to, uh, one of the tow pilots. Uh, it was just an amazing uh, association, all coming from uh, some glider programs that I put on YouTube. And then there was this gentleman, Don Adams, the uh, corporate photographer for the Douglas Aircraft Company, who called me in response to a number of Douglas videos that I had posted on the channel. 
and Don and I have become friends. He is uh, currently 92 years young and uh, just an amazing uh, persona. And we get together for lunch every once in a while and talk about the great company. But here's some of Don's work. And these were taken from a variety of airplanes, uh, Navy uh, TV2, T-33 version uh, in Navy use. And then there was this photo taken from a Bell 47 helicopter of the rollout of the Douglas DC-8 at Long Beach. And I remember looking at this image and thinking, wait a minute, I've seen this before. Could it possibly be? Yes, it was the inspiration for uh, Jack Linwood's DC-8 uh, for Ravel models. You didn't think I was going to do a video without a model box stop, did you? And then I was contacted by the pilot of the F-15 that I flew when I was assigned to the 5th Fighter Interceptor Squadron at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. It was quite a ride. We went to 45,000 feet, got to uh, just about Mach 1.5. And as they said in the movie uh, Maverick, Top Gun, that's a kill. Uh, there was my hometown airport, Zons, where I flew the uh, Cherokee 180. And I was contacted by a number of people uh, who had flown there, uh, one of whom was a, an instructor while I was a line boy. And I had been selling some artwork to help uh, fund my, my flying lessons. And uh, I was actually contacted by the instructor who flew this Cessna 150 at a neighboring school on the field, Sig Yeldert, uh, at Zons Airport in 1967. Small world. And finally... Uh, this is one of the more amazing ones. I had mentioned that I had a flight on the Concorde. I did a video on that whole airplane uh, a while back and uh, had a jump seat flight uh, from Paris to New York and then on to Miami as part of a uh, the first two legs of a world charter. And I was contacted in the comments on my Concorde episode by an air traffic controller who had actually worked that flight on January 11th, 1998. It's amazing to uh, think that this airplane flew twice the speed of sound and flew for uh, uh, a number of decades in service. Hard to believe it's gone. But as I mentioned, certain aviation phenomena simply cannot be explained. So there you have it. Stories, amazing stories and coincidences in aviation. Special thanks to the wonderful folks who helped uh, make these stories possible. And I would like to dedicate this uh, video to the memory of Casey Law, who lost his battle with cancer earlier this year. So thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machado. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And as always, until next time, take care.